Prime Minister, uh, Excellencies, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, my name is Kishore Mabubani. I'm the Dean of the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy and it gives me great pleasure to welcome you uh, to this public lecture by the Prime Minister of Bhutan. Uh, I will keep up the tradition of the uh, school here and I'll make three points uh, to you. Uh, the first point will be about Bhutan. The second point will be about the topic, democracy. <laughs> And the third point, I'll introduce our distinguished speaker. And I want to begin with, of course, a personal confession, which is that I'm in love with Bhutan. <laughs> I, I don't know of anybody who's, who, has, who has been to Bhutan and doesn't fall in love with Bhutan. As you know, it's really a beautiful country. And when you get there, you feel like you're entering a land of magic beautiful mountains, but also beautiful people. I mean, you know, the, I, I, I completely understand why Bhutan generated this concept of gross national happiness. Because everywhere you go, you actually meet really happy people. The opposite of Singapore. You know? <laughs> Secret. <laughs> I said, well, Singaporeans are known for complaining. <laughs> The Bhutanese are known to be very happy. So it's, it's really a, a, a remarkable country. And what's even more remarkable is, you know, in a region which has seen lots of challenges and problems and all that, uh, Bhutan has been remarkably stable politically. Uh, and I must say that in 2006, the former king uh, Jigmi Singyi Wangchuk made a very wise decision to step down uh, in favor of his son, the present king, Jing Jigmi Kesar Namgyal Wangchuk, who actually visited our school uh, when he was the crown prince. So we were very happy to have him, and we consider him a friend of the school, friend of mine, friend of Singapore. So we're very happy that the Prime Minister of Bhutan has come here to maintain this close relationship that we have developed. Bhutan. Uh, the second point, very quickly, about democracy is the, the. In some ways, democracy is like the opposite of Bhutan. It used to be a magical concept. It used to be something that you revered and believed was the answer to all our problems. Now, I'm not giving away a big secret if I say that even some of the world's leading democracies are facing real challenges, right? So in that sense, discussing the concept of democracy is, I suppose, uh, a very useful thing to do. And of course, but the Prime Minister will, of course, speak about Bhutan's experience, and which, of course, is fortunately a happy experience uh, compared to that of the uh, leading countries. And so we're very grateful the Prime Minister is doing it. Now let me quickly introduce my third point uh, of distinguished guest, uh, Prime Minister Shering Topge. Uh, he was born in 1965, the year of Singapore's independence. Uh, uh, you're exactly the same age as Singapore. And he's been Prime Minister of Bhutan since 2013. He studied and uh, Gra Dr. Graham's homeschooled in Kalimpong, India. He received a Bachelor of Science uh, in Mechanical Engineering from University of Pittsburgh Swanson School of Engineering after obtaining a scholarship from the UN. And he's also, most importantly, a graduate from a school of public policy, a school which is actually a partner of the Lee Kuan Yew School, which is the John F. Kennedy School of Government at Harvard University. Uh, he was also the leader of the opposition in the National Assembly from 2008 to 2013. And he went from being the leader of the opposition to the prime minister of the country. And he's the leader of the People's Democracy Party. So with that, it gives me great pleasure uh, to welcome the prime minister to give us a breath. Thank you. So I was sitting in the sacred hall of the Tashi Chozong. waiting for my name to be called. Very nervous. 
my palms sweaty my mind reeling and yet drawing a blank I heard some names being called I was extremely anxious I was scared that if I got up too suddenly I would fall my name I heard called seemed like from a distance and I woke and I stood up very carefully I could feel my whole body shake and I walked to this grand ceremonial table picked up the pen and under his majesty the king's benevolent gaze I signed the constitution the members of the first parliament of bhutan had passed the constitution and we were signing it i was scared that i would faint because i was becoming overcome with emotion not because we were at such a historic time where we were signing a constitution but because i felt i was doing a grave disservice i felt what i was doing was wrong i shouldn't be signing this constitution you see 100 years ago our ancestors having lived through 250 years of civil strife of unpredictability of civil war of murder decided enough we need a monarchy and who better to lead the country than ugen wangchuk the first king of bhutan he had established good relations with british india with the british and so all our ancestors came together and signed one by one signed a historic contract giving the powers to one person and not just to any person but making him king and not just any king but a hereditary king for our kingdom 100 years later on the 18th of july 2008 our i a representative of the people was signing another document introducing democracy and effectively taking away power from the king and i felt that that was wrong i felt that after 100 years of continuous peace prosperity happiness in spite of all the challenging odds that i was party along with my fellow mps on signing a document that actually took away powers from the king took away powers that had served the country so well for an entire century and so i was nervous that i would be overcome with emotion and blackout thankfully i didn't i did manage to sign that constitution a constitution that was the drafting of which was led by our king our fourth king and our current king but a constitution that was not accepted by the people our constitution is different every constitution is different by the way our constitution is also different i'll give you 10 very quick reasons why i think it is different the first reason is that our constitution was the tool 
to impose democracy on Bhutan. The people didn't want democracy. We didn't want democracy. After a hundred years of peace and prosperity, who would want a change in system of government? We loved our kings. We loved all our kings. And none of us wanted democracy. And so what the king did is drafted a constitution in which he included provisions of democracy. And so he used the constitution to impose democracy on Bhutan. In every other context, in every other country, if you have democracy, if you have a constitution, you fight for democracy, you shed blood for democracy, and then you sit together and get down to the business of crafting a constitution. Here we didn't want democracy, and so the constitution was prepared to mandate and to impose democracy. So that is the first unique feature of our constitution. The second unique feature is that it is very short. All in all, it has 35 articles, barely 12,000 words. Monaco, Monaco has the shortest constitution, I believe, about 4,000 words, uh, 10 chapters. But ours is quite short. India's, by the way, 444 articles, 150,000 words. But India is a big country. <coughs> That's the second unique feature. The third unique feature is that it defines the roles of our king. Now remember, we had an absolute monarchy, an absolute monarchy that was a benevolent monarchy. We had philosopher kings, enlightened kings, and there they were the ones that crafted into the constitution an entire article defining the roles and responsibilities of our king. For instance, you couldn't be king unless you were 21 years old. That seems quite ordinary. But you cannot be king after you're 65 years. You are required to retire a king. You're required to abdicate. And the king must ho uphold the provisions of the constitution, otherwise you have to leave uh, the golden throne, step down. These are all articulated in the constitution. And what's more, it allows the people to impeach the king. And this is a very important provision in the constitution. And then we have an entire article on spirituality. Now this is important because while in Bhutan we celebrate diversity, we celebrate different religions, uh, we have a state religion which is uh, Vajrayana Buddhism, a type of Buddhism like Tibetan Buddhism. And it is important because we are the last surviving Vajrayana Buddhist country in the world. And so it is our responsibility to ensure its survival and sustainability so that future generations can also uh, have the option of practicing this form of spirituality. Then we have an entire article on our culture. Again, our culture is unique. Being landlocked, being isolated for centuries, we've developed a unique culture. And that is our responsibility to be custodians of that culture. I'm, I'm using words from the Constitution, so that we can hand it over to the next generation and preserve it for the world at large. And then we have an entire separate article on the environment. By the constitution, the state is required, the government is required to ensure that a minimum of 60% of our land is under forest cover. So today it is 72%, but the constitution would make it illegal for uh, forest cover to go below 60%. Also in the constitution, it's very, very clear. Every citizen is a trustee of our environment and natural resources for our benefit, but also for the benefit of future generations. Another unique feature is uh, on the members of parliament. The qualification of members of parliament 
uh, you must be a citizen. I think that's quite common, right? You must be, uh, you mustn't have a criminal record. Uh, not so common, <laughs> but generally <laughs> expected. <laughs> and then you must be at least 25 years of age. Again, uh, quite common, not uncommon, right? Uh, but you can't be 65. You can't run if you're 65 years. And a prime minister can serve only two terms, which is again quite common. But what is uncommon is that you must have a college degree. If you don't have a college degree, you cannot run for parliament. So that is also unique. Another distinguishing feature of our constitution is that uh, it encourages a stable government, or rather it encourages government to complete their tenure. The tenure is five years. It does so through many ways. Uh, but the lower house, the National Assembly, has only two parties. You can have only a ruling party and an opposition party. And the way we have only two parties is that we have two rounds of elections. The first round of elections, the general election, all parties participate and we choose the first two. Uh, the general round of elections, sorry, the primary round is where all the parties participate. The general round, only the two parties that have emerged as number one and number two participate, and they compete for the seats in the parliament. So one becomes the ruling party, the other becomes the opposition party. So obviously, already you don't have coalitions and you get to complete a term. No defection. So uh, uh, members of parliament cannot cross parties and therefore again leads to stability. The National Council, the upper house, the house of review, are made up of independents. The local governments are all independents. And all this, I believe, allows a government to complete its tenure. You don't have to. You can be thrown out. But it gives you, the, it gives you added possibilities to complete your tenure and hopefully implement your promises. And then we have uh, another unique feature is that GNH is imbibed in the Constitution. Gross national happiness. This is something that uh, kings have developed for Bhutan, specifically for Bhutan, a development philosophy that combines economic growth with social progress, sustainability, culture, environment, and good governance. And it is imbibed in the Constitution. The state is required to create conditions for the pursuit of gross national happiness. And this is in the Constitution. So these 10 features are what uh, are a little different in the Bhutanese uh, Constitution. So the constitution was drafted over several years. It began in 2001, where people didn't know that we were going to have democracy. A constitution is a mother law, and people accepted it. His Majesty, the fourth king, the great fourth, he commissioned the constitution and put together a drafting team, and they studied constitutions from all over the world, including that of Singapore. It was only later, when the first draft emerged, that we understood it to be multi-party democracy. People didn't want it. We didn't want the constitution. And His Majesty the King distributed the constitution to each and every family throughout the length and breadth of our country. And then he traveled throughout our country and held meetings with the people, with his people, to discuss the constitution and in doing so to discuss democracy and everybody said please no we don't want democracy we know what democracy is we've seen democracy in the neighboring countries we know the type of animal that the politician is and we don't want democracy but the king prevailed he kept telling, meeting after meeting, person after person, that look, you cannot guarantee the quality of future kings. You cannot guarantee the quality of a future person. And therefore, we must start democracy 
on our own terms when the time is right and the time is right now to get people excited he organized mock elections to say okay this is how our democracy is going to be run we're going to have these elections that was not necessary because unknown to us his majesty the fourth king was already implementing training exercises for democracy he became a king as a teenager in 1972 but early on when he started talking about gross national happiness his first quote was gross national happiness is more important than gross national product and in gross national happiness good governance is one of the most important pillars and in good governance is democratic principles and very early on in 1981 he devolved powers from the center to the districts in 1991 he devolved power from the districts to the villages and when I say devolved power the people who exercised those powers were always elected and so we had a good practice of electing leaders and representatives in 1998 he devolved powers from the golden throne absolute executive powers to an elected council of ministers <coughs> and so people really had experience in voting yet he conducted mock elections so in 2007 in April 2007 he conducted the mock primary elections where we have multiple parties so we had Druk Green Party Druk is Bhutan Druk Green Party Druk Red Party Druk Yellow Party Druk Blue Party and and we had people from the National Institute of Education trainees campaigning you know being uh, members of different parties and campaigning and debating on television to explain to the people what democracy is about and the more they campaign the more people were convinced that this is not the type of government we want <laughs> so in April the mock election uh, about 50% of the people registered voters 50% of the mock uh, uh, turned out to vote in the mock elections the green part uh, the, the the green and the blue lost out to the red and the yellow party now we had to have the primary uh, the, sorry the general elections yeah, and the the red party and the yellow party fielded dummy candidates for the 47 seats in the National Assembly in May 2007 again about 55 percent of the people registered voters turned out to vote the yellow party won 46 seats the red party won only one yellow <laughs> represents our king so it was very clear our people didn't want democracy we wanted our king but there was another indicator that showed that people didn't want democracy this was in 2006 elections were announced for 2008 and not a single political party was formed forget political parties not a single person stepped forward and said okay I am going to participate I'm going to take part in the political process it was so bad that in 2006 in December his majesty came on television and addressed the nation and said look democracy is important democracy is here to stay we are going to introduce it now please those of you who care for the country those of you who care for the future those of you who are able step forward start political start the political process start political parties please you are not being disloyal to the monarchy instead you are being loyal to the king's command I didn't sleep that night I couldn't sleep that night I felt that we Bhutanese had to obey a command I didn't sleep for several other nights in the next several more nights in the next month and in February 2007 
I tendered my resignation from my job. I was a civil servant, a director in the Ministry of Labor and Human Resources. I was the first civil servant to resign. In fact, I was the first Bhutanese person to publicly declare that I am going to participate in the democratic process. I didn't consult my wife. <laughs> I hadn't consulted my parents. I hadn't consulted any of my friends. Because if I did consult my wife, she would have put her hand down. If I did consult my parents, they would have said, no, nothing doing. If I did consult my friends, they would have mocked me. And so in February, I joined, or rather, I started a political party. I had no idea what I was doing. I talked to people. I got people interested. I talked to civil servants, talked to people in uh, the non-governmental sectors, talked to a few uh, village leaders. We got together a team. And we decided on a name, People's Democratic Party, for no reason. Just sounded good. <laughs> Belong to the people, yeah? And, and by the way, politics in Bhutan, you cannot associate with the monarchy. There's nothing about the monarchy. You can't even have the color yellow. And so we started the People's Democratic Party. Uh, we had a logo of a galloping horse. And then uh, we prepared some pamphlets about what our party is about. Now, this is the other unique thing about democracy in Bhutan. Political parties, like the People's Democratic Party, were formed to participate in democracy, to fulfill our king's command. We were not, we didn't form because we had a vision. We didn't start because we had a better alternative. We knew how to get things done. We wanted to take the country to a different place. None of that. We just formed ourselves into a political organization to take part in the democratic process. We didn't have any ideology. And so we formed together as a group and we started working towards the elections. We went out to the grassroots. We, we thought we bought on board, got on board, co-opted most of the grassroots leaders. And we were nearing the elections. The third quarter of 2007, the elections were announced for the first quarter of 2008. Yet there was no other political party. And then there was one called the BPUP, Bhutan People's United Party. And then another one called BNP, Bhutan National Party. And remember, the names have nothing to do with ideology, okay? They just picked up randomly. And that didn't work. And then a third party came about, All People's Party. And that also didn't work. And then finally, a group of senior ministers came together and told the three parties, OK, if you join and give some other conditions, then we will start uh, a party with you. And, and the Druk Pinsum Sokpa, DPT, was born. The three parties merged and formed one party. On our side, we lobbied. I uh, uh, begged and pleaded <coughs> with a very senior minister, who was my mentor, uh, to become the president of our party. And he agreed. And we got another minister. But then the other candidates, we had lawyers, we had doctors, engineers, economists, statisticians. And we thought we put together a dream team. And we had the party organization, and we were ready to uh, govern. In March 2008, the first parliamentary elections took place. We didn't have the primary round, because we had only two political parties. So we went straight for the general elections. And uh, we were very optimistic. So, on 24th of March, I cast my vote, and uh, early on, after months of campaigning, and, uh, and then I made my way home. Now, home was three days, two days walking and a day by car.
And I decided that I had to get home that night because the results are going to be declared. We're probably going to have to talk about uh, portfolios and get ready, you know, organize ourselves. And, and my wife and I walked. This two-day journey by foot, we intended to, intended to cover it in nine hours and then get on a car and go straight to Timpu and join the celebrations. We walked. And by 5 p.m., we turned the radio on. By 6 p.m., the results started coming in. I had won, personally, my constituency. <coughs> but we got a walloping. The results were 45-2. So I and one other colleague, a very qualified colleague who was a judge, who was a lawyer, the two of us had won and everybody else had lost. Not just lost, we lost big time, including the senior minister who was leading our party. So they're just the two of us. And it occurred to me that I didn't have to rush back to the capital. I didn't have to rush back home. There was not going to be any celebration. So my wife and I got to the nearest village at 3 a.m. in the morning. And I tried to sleep. So we got back to Tempo, and I realized that we are not in government. Not that it mattered, because we really didn't know what we would have done. But we really didn't, at least we had thought about it. We had, I personally had not thought anything about opposition. I had no idea that we would be in opposition. We're still just a two-member opposition. So the two of us were there, getting ready. I remember the first television interview. The anchor asked me, so, are you scared? I said, no, I'm not scared. I was lying. <laughs> and then I said, the people are behind us. The people of Bhutan are there to support us. I was petrified. I said, the constitution is clear. The constitution will protect us. <laughs> really mortified. And then I said, our king is there. He will guide us. Our king will provide me the inspiration and the confidence. Our king will give me the courage to discharge my responsibilities as a constructive opposition as required by the constitution. And then I said, on my part, I will promise to work very hard. I will work day and night. And so one of the first things I did is travel the country. I went to every district, most villages, explaining the role of the opposition. And then I came back home and I decided that I have to start writing. Now I'm not a writer. I'm an engineer by training and I don't like to write. It's too hard work for me. But I started writing and I kept a blog. I started going on Facebook and on Twitter, one of the earliest Bhutanese to do so. But my blog got traction. And I found out that I had to write every day. And I found out that I was really thinking the whole day about what I'm going to write about, what are the issues I'm going to write about, and how I'm going to present it to the people. And that really helped me, because I, you are looking, you are hearing, you are listening all the time. And my blog was quite critical. Uh, it's still online, <laughs> you can have a look at it. I, uh, uh, I'm not active any longer. But I used the blog as a tool of uh, my responsibilities in the opposition. And then in the parliament, we did our best. Now, we are only two members in the opposition. And our parliament is structured that we sit according to a constituency, not according to party. So I am from Ha, my friend is from Gaza. And, 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 and between uh, our, uh, our constituency is a great dif uh, distance. Uh, in fact, I was the opposition leader, so I sat in the front, and he sat in his constituency seat, which means between my colleague in opposition and myself, 
there were something like 30 other members of the ruling party, so we couldn't consult. <laughs> Yet, both of us took the floor. Issue after issue after issue. Scared, yes. <laughs> because uh, it, it, it's very easy to be marginalized and attacked and called names and accused of causing disharmony in the country and in society. But we did our best. In fact, we did more. Because the government decided to introduce taxes on motor vehicles. Well, increase taxes on motor vehicles. And the two of us said, it's illegal. You're required to go through parliament. We thought it was very, very clear. They said, no. The cabinet can impose taxes. And, and, and we had a good debate in parliament. Uh, I thought we were convincing, but they didn't listen to our arguments and they imposed the taxes. Now that gave us opportunity and imposed responsibility on us. Uh, it was very scary, but we took it to court. In August 2010, we went and filed a constitutional case. The two of us versus 45 of them, among them very senior, established, not just ministers, but figures of our personalities in our society. So we took it to the high court and we won. They didn't believe that we had won, so they appealed. The Supreme Court again ruled in our favor. Not only did they rule in our favor, but they allowed us, they, they, they agreed that the government must be made to return all the taxes that they had collected illegally. This must be the, one of the only countries where <laughs> the government had to seek out all the taxpayers and really hand back their money. I mention this because I felt that during the first term, regardless of who's in government, who's in opposition, we have different democratic institutions. All must play our respective parts, honestly, to ensure that democracy works. So we had won the constitutional case. But overall, I was scared. I was nervous. I was concerned. This is not Bhutan. This is not how we Bhutanese are to be working. We should be in harmony. And so, with all my apprehensions, we went into the second elections in 2013. By then, the incumbent government, even though they had lost the uh, constitutional case, they were well organized. They, they were ready. They had good candidates. They had a good organization. Good supporters. To make matters worse, we had new parties. The Druk Nyamrup Sokpa, Druk Chirwang Sokpa, Bhutan Kinyam Party. They also were organized, especially Druk Nyamrup Sokpa. They managed to get a lot of technocrats on their side. On our part, we were not organized. We, were, I mean, we, we could barely fulfill our responsibility as an opposition. We didn't have time to organize ourselves. And so it was really difficult towards the end because we couldn't get candidates. And I was pleading, begging people to join us as candidates. And then we put together a manifesto and we campaigned and we into the primary round. And lo and behold, the people uh, voted uh, for us in the primary round. The Druk Funsum Sokpa, the incumbent government, got the largest number of votes and we came in second. So these two parties, our two parties, contested the primary round, uh, the general round. But before we went into the general round, we are allowed to uh, incorporate candidates who have lost from other parties. And we got seven of the, uh, of the uh, previous candidates of the Druk Nyamrup Sokpa. And they helped us a great deal. The, Druk Punzum Sokpa, they took in some candidates from another party also. And then we went into campaign. Now campaigning in Bhutan is only one month. I understand in Singapore, you are even better at this, only nine days. 
So campaigning for the uh, primary round is one month. Campaigning for the general round is one month. The other thing about our democracy is the state provides for campaign funds. It's no, it's no indiscriminate raising of money and spending of money. And the, 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 the state will say, okay, for each constituency, you get this much money, and that's it. And you spend this much money, and it's not much money. Uh, it makes campaigning a lot easier, actually, both for the politician and for the uh, voter. So we campaigned, and we, we made very simple promises. Well, some of them significant, like we're going to correct the economy. The economy was in bad shape. We're going to create jobs. Uh, there were more and more unemployment. But mainly, rural folks, you need better roads. You need uh, mechanization. You need uh, electric fences. You need farmers, shops. Very, very simple things that people could relate to. And because they could relate to us, I think they uh, uh, gave us uh, their confidence. In May, uh, sorry, in August 2000 and July 2013, uh, we won the elections. So it was 32 and 15. So the earlier ruling party got 15, we got 32. Now, the test of a democracy is not the first election. In fact, the first election is not a test of democracy. It proves that democracy is taking place. I mean, it, you can't have democracy, you can't introduce democracy without the first election. So the first election is a given. The test of democracy is the second election. Because many times after the first election, the incumbent is so empowered and so happy that you don't want to have the second election. So we have had the second election. But the bigger test is a transition of power. Can you have a different party take over and win? And can you trans uh, transition peacefully? And we had fulfilled both the criteria. So we are in government now. We had to make sure that our people trusted democracy. It's not about us. It's about democracy. It's not about us. It's about our king's vision of democracy. And so our priorities, for instance, making sure that the people don't feel betrayed, that we are helping select people, that a few powerful families, a few powerful businesses are benefiting. If people feel that, their trust for democracy is ruined. Related to that, making sure people see that we don't differentiate. It doesn't matter which political party you stood for, which party you supported. Everyone, as long as it is in accordance with the law, should benefit from democracy. And then it's the rule of law. Making sure that people are subject to the rule of law. That corruption does not take root. That we are seen to be fighting corruption with the rest of the country. And then we have democratic institutions, whether it's the judiciary, the anti-corruption commission, especially the election commission, to maintain their independence, to foster a vibrant uh, media, which is easier said than done, but to really foster, to give them confidence. It's easier said than done because we don't have the market, we don't have the scale to allow for uh, profitable media. So these institutions of democracy are very, very important. And then there's our promises. We have made promises to fight poverty, to correct the economy, to create jobs, to improve living standards, especially in the villages. We have to fulfill our promises. Otherwise, I have no business part, taking part in the democratic process. Otherwise, I should never have resigned on that fateful day in February 2007. I'm going to be very honest. As a member of the ruling party, as a prime minister, I spend many more sleepless nights and I'm much more scared than when I was in opposition. If I thought being in opposition and the opposition leader was scary, it is nothing compared to my experiences as the Prime Minister, I am scared. 
but I still have my king. For inspiration, for guidance, and for courage. Thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you.